Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Nigel here, Nigel's Modeling Bench, and this is part four now of the uh, Dasworks U boat U9 um, from the First World War. So, U9, U10, U11, or 12, whichever one you want to build. So, uh, I left you last time, we'd, we'd got the fuselage all glued together, and there we are, and it's been left for, I don't know, 12 hours. So, there we go, it's, uh, it's all nice and dry now, so we can remove all our pegs and clamps and rubber bands and things and we can have a look at the, uh, the seam work now we need to be very careful here in fact I should take the rubber bands off backwards on the bow we've got these tiny little pins sticking out and there like you see I've snapped one off there and they're where the rigging is going to go which is the protection beams or protection ropes for the um, diving planes so we've got the same on the rear end as well for the uh, for the propellers. So I mean, it'll look quite an interesting little feature because there's cables and turnbuckles and everything. I'll show you them here in case you're not. Let's get that out of the box. We don't want to scratch that up. In case you're not familiar with the kit, um, here we go. Look, have it the right way up, nice. That helps. You can see we've got here some. Uh, just check you're not all glossed out. You can see we've got some turnbuckles here, and then we. We actually put these these ropes on now the thing is what they're telling you to do is attach that rope to the part that's sticking out of the hull and if we look closely at them I'm not sure how good a focus we're gonna get here let's get them out a bit better for you you can see it's just like a plastic rod with a square end so I don't quite know how we're gonna actually fit anything to that I'm tempted to kind of drill them out and put a piece of um, tube in there so that I can put the rope the rope through the tube and glue it. We'll, we'll see but I'm, I'm gonna have to look at that before we put the deck in because um actually no I have to put the deck in first here because it's going to be drilling into the deck but uh, yeah I'm not sure, quite sure how we're going to fix those on <clears throat> nice and firmly um on the back end where they go they sort of fit onto these sort of raised areas which are a bit bigger um but again I don't know how you're going to do a really nice tidy job we might see if we can just drill a hole down the side of them or something. We'll have a look at that soon. Right, so there's that intake exhaust tube, which is uh, which is lovely. All the seams are gone. Just check there's been no shrinkage. I can't see anything on there, so mind you saying that, I'm bloody blind. But uh, yeah, all the seams on there look lovely. There we go. All sorted. If you remember, we thinned out the ends in part uh, in part three to give a much improved look. Really, I should draw that out more. But um, what's that on there? Um, really, I should draw that out more. But uh, don't really want to. So um, we shall see. It's only because the light's actually shining straight down there. If I if I move the light away, look how it see how it disappears. You can see you can't see the bottom now. You can if I hold it right in the light, but you know. So uh, anyway, let me get myself sorted out, see where we're going, and uh, and then I'll be back with um, with our next operation. Okay, so something I'd forgotten about. Remember where I put my finger on there, made that fatal mistake, and the glue oozed and capillaried up under my finger. So we've got that that sort of gluey mess there. Okay, now wouldn't really need to worry about it too much on this because it's it's going to get beaten battered anyway. But here I've got a fiberglass pencil and if I very gently, and I mean gently, rub over that area that's got the glue marks on it, you will see that those glue marks will disappear. And it won't even remove the rivet detail. Let's get it to focus. So you can see there that the, the glue mark has disappeared but the rivet detail is still there and that is a fiberglass pencil available from RS you can get them from all sorts of model suppliers but I think they're cheaper to buy as a fiberglass pencil from a sort of engineering suppliers um, and then you get the, the fiberglass in the end which is extendable so uh, works really really well fantastic for polishing brass um, and removing excess solder so Really, really handy tool to have. Um, and as I say, you just gently rub over. Need the bristles sticking out about three millimeters. And you just gently rub over. You can see there, 
I can get it in focus. We can see we've got some glue marks there, look. Excuse my disgusting fingernails. Okay, well, if I just gently rub over that. You can see there the glue marks have disappeared. Well, all but disappeared, sort of dirt in there because of the, uh, been using it on brass. But the rivets are still there. So just a gentle rub over the fine sanding stick and all that will be done. I'm not going to do that scene right now because we're going to be putting it down and everything. I've got the base over here. I've given the base uh, the base a coat of primer last night. And um, you guys that are new to the hobby and you want to look about removing injection pin marks, you can see how my solution works. If you look down in there, there is no evidence whatsoever of any injection pin marks. Okay, and the work we did on the inside of these with the plastic sheet obviously did the trick. And then you've got the areas on the ends here that were that were sunken in. They disappeared as well. But that is just a very, very thin coat, literally a dusting of um of the uh, Badger Steiner res or the MIG one shot ammo primer, which is great stuff. Um it's probably the best product he makes. Um, but yeah, because it's, it's made by Badger, but uh, it's really, really good, really, really good stuff. So, um, moving on through the instructions, remember we didn't glue the ends of these rods or the bulkheads in place because we want the the fuselage, the hull, whatever you want to call it, we still want it to be able to flex. So what they're telling us in the instructions now is we need to start looking at the deck. So we need to find somewhere to park this out of the way. There we go. That's out of the way. And um, we're going to have a look at this deck. We've got the little piece that goes up underneath here. This piece. And we've got that tube that's going to go up inside it. Where did I put that? There it is. So and I drilled these out. And you'll see why I drilled them out later. I have a cunning plan. So that's going to go in there. Like that. And then that's going to go up in there like that oops catching the wires and and then that's going to be able to fold up and down now unfortunately it's very very loose so my plan is to either push some rod down through that hole and spread it so that it makes it gives it a bit of friction or i will put some plastic card on the outside with a piece of rod in it and that will just be offset enough to give it some some friction. It doesn't need much. It just needs enough friction so that it doesn't fall down under its own weight. So that's my plan there. Um, so what I could do, I should put a piece of brass rod through there, glue it in, and then put a piece of plastic card on and pull it to one side so that it's providing friction. But we'll look at that after we've got it in there. Now, before we fit it, I think I need to paint it because masking it and painting it in situ is going to be very difficult. So I think what I'll do is mask it up and paint it um, before we fit it in there. And then it'll just be a simple case of wrapping something around it when we spray the rest of the deck. Um, but, you know, getting all in here nice and tight to these clamps and everything will be a little more difficult once it's in situ because you've got the, it's going to be attached to a great big long sausage. So um, the other thing we need to look at here, now a lot of you will say, don't be stupid, there's no point. But for the newer people around there, what we see here, we've got sink marks. Now, this is a feature that you find a lot on model kits where you've got a plastic, a thicker section on the back side. What happens is the larger mass of plastic in that area cools and shrinks more than this area here, which is thinner. So you get a sink mark. You'll normally see it like on older kits where you've got a, um, a big lug inside for something, or, you know, a, a big, there'll be a inside of the fuselage on a bomber say there'll be big lugs where they fit the, the ammunition um, um, crates for the guns and that and you look on the surface on the outside and there's a sink mark because years ago they didn't worry about that sort of thing they, nowadays we do and unfortunately <clears throat> with injection molding if you're trying to produce a process that's going to actually make you some money um, this is kind of very very difficult to to avoid you can use special plastics you can use um, temperature and you can use time to help avoid it but unfortunately it is just you know it's the same if you paint something 
you know, if your paint is thicker in one area than the other, it will dry in a different way, other than like a two pack, which it dries on the outside in. Um, so there we go. Uh, so we need to do something about that. And I'm going to fill them with, you guessed it, Mr. Surfacer. Now, comments, questions and everything. Um, let me just go and check as I, so I can answer any of your comments or queries because I've got a couple in mind but there may be a couple that were added yesterday that I need to add to and these are going to be the comments and answers from uh, part two okay so looking at the the questions um silent farmer uh, commented on the um david 400 um sandra I was using which is an amazing bit of kit I mean you can you can see in there the kind of results you get really flat no undulations no sort of beveling in of the corners or anything and uh yeah it's too well worth having said it was a bit pricey yes um you know it's the same as the kit everything these days is pricey and i think as we get older we kind of not saying that you're very old at all you might be 20 years old for all i know silent farmer but um i know that i often look at stuff and think god blimey that's expensive but then i kind of think to myself well you know 10 years ago, a car that was £6,000 is now nine, £10,000. You know, 10 years ago, six, £7,000 was a sort of budget car. You know, these days it's nine, £10,000 is a budget car. Think about the something like a Citroen C1, you know, that, something like that. Um, in the UK, certainly. But don't forget, mine, uh, you can, if you use my code NMB10, you can get 10% off that price. So it becomes about... £80 rather than £90 or £70 rather than 80 I can't remember how much it was now. But um, yeah, use that code if you're in the UK and you can get a, a decent price. Um, another one was P. Uh, the PE set was mentioned by Marius. Um, the PE set is going to be made by a company, or is made by a company called RC Subs. I've mentioned him before. I've got a couple of his sets and stuff. Um, his PE is very good, but it's not like Edward. It's not sort of going to be great for the beginner and newer, newer people to the hobby they need to start off on something a bit simpler um it's very much sort of you're going to do a lot of fabricating sort of making parts up wrapping them around um tube and stuff rather than having just sort of flat pieces that glue on there are a lot of flat pieces that glue on but uh and then there he commented that the bow was very um blunt and should be sharpened up well I would kind of dispute that because I've looked at some pictures because I thought the bow looked very, very blunt myself. And I th thought about thinning it out. Because um, obviously, you know, from my Titanic and other work that I do, you know how I like to modify stuff. But when I looked at some photographs, yeah, sure, the photographs in the book that come with the model, there is a big image there of them all sort of lined up outside uh, at the docks. And um, the, the, the bow on them is very, very sharp. But they're like U13, U22, and they were a different um, a different sub. So, I sorry, 23, 22. Um, I, 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 there's a picture of U9 itself in the water moving, and you can see that the bow is making quite a quite a disturbance in the water. So I'm thinking that yeah, it's a bit square, but I'm just going to radius this off. Um, I don't think it's too fat. I stand to be corrected if I'm wrong, but I I don't think it was that sharp of a point. But, you know, we shall see. Um, at the end of the day, this model is all about building it out of the box and having a finished model at the end of, the end of it. This is not like the Titanic. This is not a big accurization um, lesson. This is all about, you know, getting all of this model, building it out of the box and making it look pretty. So that's that's what I'm doing. So, um, yeah, there could be errors. I mean, the back might be too fat. These holes might be in the wrong place. There might be that hole maybe should be sort of three millimetres further back. And these plates are too closely spaced together. And this plating is wrong. And this is too thick. You know, I'll thin stuff out. I'll try and make it a bit more detailed. But I'm not going to start, you know, sort of trying to correct everything. So, um, there we go. Maybe, maybe I'll get another one and do that on that one. So, uh Right, moving on. Oh, one other thing I want to say. Somebody made a comment on my sprue goo video, um, which I put out ages and ages ago. And they commented that, I won't mention any names, but they commented that they thought sprue goo was a stupid, uh, well, not stupid, but an unnecessary um, thing, if you like, 
because these days there are fillers out there that you don't need to rub down in some cases and they're fantastic and everything. And my response to that was, yeah, that's wonderful. But if you think about it in terms of my Titanic, you name me another filler that bonds the plastic together, that is the same hardness as the plastic when it comes to sanding, and you can glue plastic to it with polystyrene cement. There is one out there. So, and if you're going to start comparing sprue goo to stuff like this, where is it? This one here. Um, that. Don't even bother because that is just, it's, it's, it's tile grout. So, you know, um, there are all sorts of mediums out there. There's, you've got to remember in this day and age, there are a million people out there that want to be rich and they will sell you anything to get rich. I've even seen a company that was selling a wax machine that put molten wax into the joints on your model. Great. How are you going to paint molten wax? Or when it's solidified, how are you going to paint it? So, you know, um, I, I kind of look at all these new gizmos and gadgets and everything. And it's like, you know, there's companies out there we don't need to mention that they will sell you a black wash for engines. They'll sell you a black wash for military aircraft from World War Two. They'll sell you a black wash for military aircraft from World War One. They'll send you a black wash for tanks, a black wash for European tanks, a black wash for American tanks, a black wash for the Japanese Navy, a black wash for the German Kriegsmarine. It's like, oh, God, you know, black wash is black wash for God's sake. So be careful how you spend your money, guys. That's all I'm saying. Right. So these little divots in here, we're going to put some Mr. Servicer in them. And once again, I am going to use my brown one because I like it and it's very good. I don't ever shake this stuff. I noticed the other day um, I saw Jason did a video and he picked up his bottle of Mr. Servicer and he shook it to get it all agitated. I never do that. The reason being is what happens is it all goes up the sides here and all in your cap. And then when you put it back together, your cap is all bonded to your, your lid. Now, even without shaking it, this is just from literally tipping it up to show you guys the last time I used it. A little tip for you with your Mr. Servicer. When you get these big build-ups on the edge, if you get a knife under there and cut it off, okay, and push it in, as long as it is just pure Mr. Servicer, it will dissolve back into it. So you've got that big chunk there, you can cut that off, and that can go in. And it saves you wasting it, and it saves the lid sticking back on. And I, believe me, there may be people out there now going to say, you're mad, you shouldn't be doing that. You're putting lumps of paint. Yeah, believe me, it will dissolve. And um, this is something I've always done, and... Uh, I don't think I never clean my brushes with Mr. Surfacer. I'm just going to get this off the bench here and drop some off. Um, I never clean my brushes with Mr. Surfacer. I always reuse them. Um, here we go. Here's one here. That one there is the one I used for Mr. Surfacer last. It's got Mr. Surfacer caked into it. Actually, no, this is the one I use for the glue, isn't it? It's not the Mr. Surfacer one at all. So this may not dissolve. I may have to put it in some acetone. In fact, what I'm going to do, just in case, because either way it will clean it, I am going to put the brush in an old bottle of Mr. Cement S, and then whether it's glue or Mr. Surfacer, it will remove it. And it looks like it was Mr. Surfacer, because it's brown in colour. So, um, all good there. Right, so... Got our brush here with a Mr. Surface room. We're pulling some up the sides. The reason I'm pulling some up the sides is it will be thicker. Okay, and then we can literally just brush this on. Now I'm going to try and stay out of these seam lines or these panel lines. I mean, you could, if you want to, you could just go over this and, and just sand it until it disappears. But. This is all about showing you guys how to get over <clears throat> how to get over obstructions, how to cure issues, and how to how to you know take your model to the next level, as they say. That's a I think that's a patented phrase, isn't it? Taking modeling to the next level. So there we go. 
think I'm allowed to say it, but I don't think I'm allowed to print it on anything. And if you older guys in the UK, you remember, there was a housing company built new houses and they used to have a phrase, we're building houses to make homes in. Guess who came up with that phrase? Yep, it was me. I entered a competition. You had to enter, enter a competition and you could win a prize for coming up with a slogan they could use in their advertising campaigns. And I'd visited a show home. This would have been back in about 19... Oh, blimey, 1985, 1982 even. And uh, <clears throat> entered this competition. And it was just there on the spot at the moment. And I thought, yeah, we're building houses to make homes in. And it was me that came up with that. So if you heard it and you remember it, yeah, that was yours truly. I think it might have been, was it David Wilson? I can't remember the man, the, the builder now. There we go, we can see it's, uh, there's only certain areas that need it. It's, um, it's sort of catching it in the light and I can see where it needs it. And like I say, there are people that are going to think this is absolutely crazy doing this. You know, it's a, it's a U-boat. Um, but, you know, I think it needs it. So I'm going to carry on and do that rather than have you just listen to me talk a load of crap and then uh, I'll be back. OK, so we're ready to start doing some painting. Um, I've got my airbrush set up. I've got a roughly 60% sort of thinners, 40% paint mix of Tamiya's XF19 Sky Grey as called up in the instructions. Now, I'm not going to discuss German colours uh, because I don't know verbatim what these colours should be. But if they're saying XF19 is the correct colour, which is RAL 7001, they're also saying you should use H51. RAL 001 FS36375 is XF19, which is equivalent to H308. And if I can show you briefly, because I haven't got myself prepared, but here's 51. And here's blah, 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 308, here's 308. And you can see that the three colours, all of them are different. But you can see this one is a lot closer to this one. So this one here is not the correct colour, I would say, for the XF19 36375. It's sort of, this one's sort of in between the two. So I'm going to go with the XF19 purely because for me, it's the most easily available. I can get it in my local hobby craft, which is a for those not in the UK. It's a UK craft store, um, so I'll use that one up rather than use that one up. Um, I would be using the Tamiya LP colours, the lacquer paints, but unfortunately they're so good that there are none available in the UK that I know of of that colour. So um, please don't send me links below to tell me that I can get a paint from somewhere because I'm using XF19 now. So um, there we go. So, uh, right, let's get this painted. I'm not worried about masking or anything at the moment because we'll mask off this light grey after and then spray the darker grey on there. So, airbrushing here, just very, very lightly passing over the, the surface. I'm not trying to flood anything. I'm not trying to cover anything with one coat. And remember, I'm only trying to do the larger, the shorter of the two tubes. I'm not, I'm not interested in the, uh, the longer one. The longer one would just be overspray. Overspray is the result of overspray is just the result of um, the, the paint that's actually you know not hitting the uh, not hitting the part we want to do. Airbrush it here. For those of you new to the hobby that are just starting out with airbrushing, I would advise um, going with the Tamiya 
AK Real Color, not AK, AK Real Color, the stuff in the jars, not the, the Viejo type bottles, um, or Mr. Hobby, or, or indeed the Tammy LPs, although they're a little bit smelly. Um, probably go, if you, if, you can, if you can get around the issues of smell and extraction and everything, start off on the Tammy LPs because they're going to be your number one paint going forward, I think. Uh, Mr. Hobby is very good. Tammy is very good, uh, but as long as you thin it with them, a solvent thinner, um, maybe cellulose thinners or uh, Mr. Color Leveling thinners, which is what I use. I'm using here now, which is this one here. Ignore the 400, that's just the size of the bottle. What you want is Mr. Color Leveling thinner, and it's really, really good stuff. It mixes pretty much with anything. Avoid your AK bottle sprays, avoid your Viejo, Vallejo, whatever these. I'll show you a bottle now. Um, this one here. Um, they're okay. They're, they're they're great paints. They're not very smelly or anything, but they do. They're they're such a nightmare. They they, they clog up. You get tip dry. You can add all sorts of stuff to them. And I know people are going to say in the comments below that I'm talking rubbish, but let me just tell you this: you can get an airbrush which isn't even properly clean. You can put a couple of drops of thinners in there, a couple of brushfuls of paint with Tamiya, stir it up, and paint it. Okay, no issue. With the Viejo stuff, you put it in there. If you don't thin it, it's too thick. If you thin it with the wrong thinners, you get cottage cheese. If there's anything in your airbrush already that's going to affect it, then it will affect it. Um, you know, and then you need to use airbrush flow improver. Well, for Christ's sake, they're making a paint here, which is called Viejo Model Air. It's designed to be used in an airbrush. But if you want to use it in an airbrush, you need to buy this because you're going to get loads of tip dry. Okay, but because it's too thick, you need to buy, where is it? I've lost it, here it is. You need to buy this. Okay, so to make this airbrush paint, airbrush ready paint work, you need airbrush flow improver and thinners. What? You know, it's just, it's just a joke. And then you'll still get problems. Go and have a look at my um, B52 build I'm doing and look at the problems I'm having spraying it with that and then compare that to what I'm doing with this. And if you want to see the AK stuff, go and watch the um, old scale modeling. That guy's doing a 700 scale uh, Scharnhorst and he's decided to start using AK paints. And just watch the problems he has, but then watch him. Don't, don't turn the video off, fast forward or whatever. He goes back to his normal, I think Mr. Color paints or Tammy or whatever, and it just paints. It's like this stuff, this will just paint. I can leave it in the airbrush here and talk to you like I just have, and it just paints. If I did that with Viejo, the end would be all dried up and clogged up and blocked. You know, so if you are new to the hobby, start off with your normal Tamiya acrylics, these here, okay? Or your LPs, which are these here with the, you can see your LP on there, and then some of them have got a black label, and I think, look at that, I've got a feeling maybe that black label is some, um, is showing that it's a metallic. I've only just noticed that as I'm talking to you now. So, but they are wonderful. I have, I've, I'm gonna do a video all about them. I haven't yet used them, um, but I did a tr little trial last night with a brush and they brush very nicely. But no, this stuff is great. Don't be fooled into the Viejo or the AK route. Um, you've also got the MRP paints, which are very good, but they're very, very thin. You need to use lots and lots of coats and they are also quite smelly. So yeah, if you are new to the hobby, this one, or where is it? This one, which is your Mr. Hobby Aqueous, okay? Water-based acrylic paint, the labels keep changing on them. But um, your H series of Mr. Hobby or your Tamiya and get yourself some of this and you're good to go. Um, or you can use the Tamiya thinners, but it tends to be a bit grainy. So, that's my little talk for people new into airbrushing. Somebody did send me a question asking about what paint they should get, and, you know, and everything. And it's and I did, I sort of replied, and I've replied to them in the comments as well. You know, it's one of those things I can't spend forever replying to people. I'm sorry, I just don't have the time. But I don't mind doing it verbally because uh, talk is cheap, as they say. Okay, so as you can see here, just going on very, very lightly, dusting it on, just like that. And I'm going to change my angles. Just want to make sure that we get into all the corners. All right, now as a as a beginner, as a newbie, this is what you'd be doing. You'd just be painting this, 
all in one color and just get the you just want to get it that color and make sure you don't miss anywhere so that's it that's that done that's the color that the top of our sub is going to be you can see I've only used a tiny drop of paint it's a very very thin layer it's very very smooth we've got no seam lines or anything we're happy okay we have got something there I'm not sure what that is there's something under the paint I'm not sure if I can scratch that away now and then blend it in make sure the make sure the uh, blade is clean where's it gone can't even see it now there it is it's like a hair or something yeah it's in the primer so I just lightly scrape that up there we go it's gone it was a little hair or something I think Jess's fault always blame Jess if it's hairs because I don't have any there we are so I'm just going to spray that over now and like I say this is all going to be weathered anyway just blend that in there we go it's gone as good as Another good thing to learn with your airbrush, if you are new to it, you've got a double action. Double action, that's your air, okay? And then when you pull back, you get your paint. So pull back only, you get nothing, okay? Push down, you get nothing, all you get is air, and then you pull back to get your paint. And you can see here, as I push down, let me just put this to one side. As I push down, come back, get the paint start to come. All right, and you can see I'm spider, that's because I'm putting too much paint now. As I move up and back, you can see the paint becomes more effective. And the further away I get, the less paint I get. I'm not moving my finger at all. You can see that it's basically nothing now. And if I come back down close without moving my finger, you can see what's happening. Now, if you do this, you obviously don't want that. You don't want to go flooding the area with paint. I'm going to ruin my board. Um, you don't want to go flooding the area with paint. But... Uh, you just come down and spray where you're happy okay now don't go too dry don't go too wet and the other thing is try and get in the habit when you're new a lot of people what they do and I do it and I learned this from one of my subs and I've been doing this for years and I've learned something in the last six months off of one of my subs so there we go it just shows you never too old to learn something come down pull back and then when you finish painting don't just go like that come down pull back when you finish painting go forward and up and that saves any paint building up on the nozzle and what happens if i can sh i don't know if this is going to work it never works on camera if i come back and just let go when i come to spray the next time i get spattering let's see it won't do it because the camera's on but generally what you get is a build up of paint and when you next time you put you press the air the air down it spatters because it's left paint on the nozzle where you've just let it go so introduce the air introduce the paint take away the paint take away the air get that in that habit and then you won't get any spattering okay so that's a quick airbrush tutorial um as part of this sub uh, build and i'm happy with that and that's gray so there we go and there's no seams you can see job done okay so we've done our painting i've done a little airbrush demo for you guys if you're an experienced modeler i'm really sorry if you get fed up with the uh all the ex explanations for beginners but some it, it's nice to include stuff for them too because everybody starts out sometime and they all need to learn so right um we've done that we've talked about the paint colors now we need to look through the manual we've done all this we're not going to do that yet because we've got our mr surfacer on the deck drying we've got our paint on here drying so that's all going to be hanging around so let's see what we can do next and this is what something I advise anybody even beginners to do is look through manuals and see where you can move on because if you know if this was an airplane and this is all about putting the cockpit in and putting the fuselage house together if then you move on to sort of assembling the tailplanes there's nothing to stop you carrying on even though it's you don't have to wait to finish that before you do that just be careful you don't you know you don't want to start um fitting the cockpit in for instance before you start fitting the detail inside the cockpit sidewalls 
that sort of thing. So just be careful what you're doing. So we're looking in here and we're going to do the uh, control tower. So we've got just a few parts going together. We've also got some painting to do in here. So um, let me get these parts off the sprue, get them cleaned up and then we'll get them together. All these parts are cleaned up now and as you can see we've got the parts here from from this assembly here and if we go over the page we can see we're going to be adding the top of the um, top of the, the uh, conning tower and then we've got this piece going here which is going to be the support for the masts and stuff for snorkel and everything I'm guessing and we've got this internal piece here with the ladder on and you can see there we've got to paint it white with the uh, features in black and then Moving forward, we are going to be fitting. Sorry, I'm not moving forward at all. We've got that going together there, and then moving forward, we've got the hatch going on there. So I'm thinking, well, all this is white inside. The inside of the hatch is going to be white. So I'll get it all off the sprues. I'll get it all cleaned up and get ready to go. So I've taken this piece and thinned out this area here to make it look more authentic, so it's not like a great thick chunk of plastic. And then we'll have the ladder underneath there that you'll be able to see down through, which will look cool. But then I look to the hatch, no detail. Now these hatches that go further along the hull have got the internal detail. Where is it? I did see it just now. These here have got the internal detail with the hand wheel and everything on them um, for these positions, but nothing for here. So we've got the same there, look. And they're completely different, so I can't sort of swap them over. So kind of thinking, well, bloody point this year, giving us the option of having the hatch open, but there's no internal detail. Whether they're supposed to be or not, I don't know, but there is an injector, injector pin mark in there. So I'm kind of thinking that what's the point in having that open if there's no detail inside? I've looked through my spares bin trying to find an old control wheel or something I could glue in there. I can't find anything, so I've got to make my mind up. And also, in the meantime, we've got ejector pin marks here. We've got one there, and there's a sink there we'd have to get rid of if we're looking down in there. At least we have to sand it out or fill it or something. I'm not really sure how much of it you'd see, but that's kind of how it goes like that. So, yeah, you will see down on the side walls. But why on earth they've gone to the trouble of all this, this detail in here and this ladder and everything, but then not put anything on the inside that hatch. I, I just do not know. Unless there's not supposed to be anything there. So um, I think I'll have a quick look at my references. Just see if I can find anything. And if there's not supposed to be anything there. Then I'll do it. But if not it's going to have to be closed up. Because I don't see the point in having that open with nothing there. So I only found one reference. Um, which was basically of a, a conning tower in a museum. Which was all rusty and you know very rusty obviously. And the hatch was open with nothing inside it. So either what was there is rotted away, or there was never anything there anyway. Maybe this area isn't pressurised, I don't know. So, um, not pressurised, just not sealed. So, I am going to have the hatch open, just for the pure enjoyment of actually building all the interior and, and painting it all and everything. I just want to show you one little mod I always do. Um, we'll get these wet painted parts out of the way so the plastic doesn't stick to them. When you, when you look at this, um, the confinements of moulding mean that they can only sort of go like this without slide moulding. So you end up with what would be a ladder, which would be a load of bars on a tube, um, and it becomes a solid lump. So to make it look a little bit more realistic, it's not going to totally do it. But if you take the, the point of a sharp knife and you hold the knife at the same angle as the tube and just scrape away the plastic from behind, what you can very quickly do is achieve, and I'm going to bring the knife up, you can see I'm coming up to actually round the back of it off. So it's not absolutely accurate to scale, and it's not something you want to put on the surface of your favourite model, but you can probably see here that what we've got is instead of this, when you look at this end here, you've got this solid plastic lump. When you look at this end, it looks more like, when you look down through the hatch, it has a shadow. It looks more like it's actually a separate separate piece. And then we can do the same on this, this tube here, which is running vertically. So again, hold the knife, 
angle the back of the knife at the same angle as the the part you're actually scraping up against and just scrape away till you achieve a groove and then bring the knife up keep scraping and if you want to actually take one of these a round blade and go in you can actually remove some material from sort of this face if you know what I mean you do the same one here sounds like they've got me they're coming it's a lot warmer today but it's uh, well it's a lot warmer it's like two degrees I think but it's um it's bloody wet and windy so do you know since September the weather in this country has been stopping me doing anything pretty much on my Land Rover um, when it's windy I don't have the Mustang outside in case something blows on it I can't put the Raptor in the garden because the grass is like a bloody quagmire I don't want to leave the Raptor out on the road at night so uh, I can't leave the Mustang on the drive if the Raptor is not in the garden or on the road so therefore I can't have the Land Rover in the garage in the dry and I can't do any painting when it's wet cold and if the Mustang can't be out I can't do any painting when it's windy so yeah so that's why I managed to spend so much time at the bench at the moment so there we are. when you look at that now you can see it kind of looks like a tube rather than and the ladder looks like a ladder rather than just a square lump on the side so I'll go on and do the rest and then I'll show you when I finish so we've got the uh, <coughs> Mr Servicer now and all the ejector pin marks that we think we're gonna see when we look down inside and as you can see like I was talking about when I did the uh, the stand you can see how much it shrinks back which is why if they're deep I put super glue in there first um, the hatch I've done I put Mr Servicer all around it because it was quite uneven and there was an ejector pin mark in the middle so now I could just get something on my finger and just in the end of there when it's dry and that will sort of smooth that out. I should imagine it was cast anyway, so it probably wouldn't be that smooth. Um, this here, which, which means we could probably put a cast finish on here as well. That'd be interesting, wouldn't it? Um, this here, as you can see, you can't see from that angle really what I've done. Doesn't look much difference than the plastic part. But when you consider you're going to be looking at it like that, then you can see the actual work that's done. If I get it in the shadow, you can see the actual extra work scraping away all those rungs you see there what i've done i've scraped away the rungs i put glue on it afterwards just to smooth everything out scraped away the sides and then when you look down through this hatch this is how we're going to see it basically like that you can see with a coat of paint and a dry brush on there it's going to look a lot better than just that solid lump of plastic that was there before i know it's just a little something you can do I mean, it's this is what modelling is all about, guys. It's not about going out and buying resin and fitting resin parts. I mean, somebody will probably come up with a one of these with resin with super detail all over it, and gauges and God knows what, and yet they'll look amazing. But that you can do yourself. You can you can do this yourself, and it'll look lovely. You know, so kind of the, the aftermarket has gone crazy, and a lot of people love it, and they'll buy anything that comes their way. But um. You know, doing stuff like this is where the is what modelling is all about as far as I'm concerned. It's like my Titanic hull, you know, I could have bought a fiberglass hull for it or whatever if there was a one available, but I'd rather do my own. Uh, I've also given this stand um, a quick coat of this paint here, which is, where is it? It's up here. This one here, Fine Surface Primer. This, I think, is one of the best primers on the planet. This stuff is absolutely awesome. Only downside is it's smelly, so you have to use an extractor and a mask. Right guys, here we are back again. This is a couple of hours later, and I've just uh, gone to look at how much storage I've got left on my, left on my camera slash phone, and realized that during my last little segment, it decided to say it was full up. Don't know quite what's happening there, but um, anyway, so we've missed a little bit. All I've done in the meantime, um, I've primered these. This is a good idea for beginners block of foam out of your new TV or whatever you get it's not, not often you find that these days but it's always handy to keep because you can mount your parts on a cocktail stick stick them in there and let them dry or you can hold them in there to spray them if you don't want to get paint on your fingers um, so yeah we've painted that um, entrance ladder and everything that's there that's done in the black 
from the uh, what was it? The MRP. I always call it Mr. Paint. I don't know why, but it's MRP. Uh, and we've done also we've black primed the wooden area, and this sits on top of the conning tower like that. And this is where they they climb up out and they stand on there. So we're going to do some wood graining on that, which you'll enjoy. Um, if you haven't seen that before, I literally primed it because we're going to be spraying it with something like XF78 deck tan, that sort of colour. I'll, I'll have a look and see what I'm going to do with that. And then we'll be using oils to actually put on a wood grain finish um, and make it look like wood. So that'll be interesting if you haven't seen that. Um, I'm going to put a cast texture on here. I think that'll be fun. So you, if you haven't seen that, you'll enjoy that. Um, and we've put a second lot of Mr. Surfacer in all these ejector pin marks because they were quite deep. And they've sunk down so we'll have a look at rubbing them down and then once we've done that i think we'll call it a day for this part because it's night time now it's cold it's windy it's wet i don't want the windows open and i want to prime this with mrp so it's going to be quite smelly so um there we go so let's get all this rubbed down uh, the the deck is basically good i'm using a worn out 220 uh infini zebra stick here these things are bloody awesome um they uh, you if you watch my channel you've heard me say a load of times before you get these in a set this is the premium hobby stand that they go in and then you've got all your sponges there you've got all the um the matador sticks here these are the smaller ones you see me using like this one here this is a 400 grit and they go for 400 up to what's this one seven thousand i mean that's just like a piece of paper there's nothing to it but great for polishing canopies and stuff um and then you get the zebra sticks, which are the big wide ones, which are great for your general modelling. I've got four, worn out 400 there. A lot of these have been used now for brass and solder, so they're clogged up. So they need to be thrown to one side and get a new lot in here. And then you've also seen me use these. These are the little PE ones. And uh, yeah, they're absolutely brilliant. Again, if you want to get them, they're all available from um, Premium Hobbies if you're in the UK. And 10% uh, off everything. So don't forget, NMB10 gives you 10%. So, yeah, as, as I've said, these, these things, they wear out quite quickly. But when I say that, it's not a bad thing. They, when you get a 220 new, it's quite coarse. It will wear down in no time. But it gets to about 80% of what it was, and then it just stays there. Now, this I've been using, if you look back on my video, I've been using it for months. I've used it for, on solder, on resin, on plastic, on paint, on metal, on everything. And... um. They, you know, get get your old pair of jeans, get the denim bottoms off your jeans and you can wipe them off and clean them out. Somebody's also a message saying you can use a, ru a rubber or an eraser. So I'll we'll have to try that. Um, in fact, we will try that now because I've got one here. I wonder if it actually does work. This is what the guy was saying. You can rub it with an eraser and it works. Well, it's certainly not taking any of that out. So all it's doing is wearing down the rubber. So I don't know. Um, I'll try it again. So... On here, all this here is flat other than the raised detail for parts to go on. So what we can do is just get this stick down on here flat and just go in circular motions. If you go in straight lines, you will end up plowing into things and putting back bevels and chamfers and stuff. So we just rub this on here because it's all flat. We're going to clog up the detail, but we can always wash that out or blow it out. And then we can just sand away this and you can see that the, the actual, where the Mr. Surfacer is, this is the beauty of the brown stuff. Well, it's called mahogany they also do a black as well but that's only a 1500 i think um but yeah you can you can go on here and just sand this and then you can see when you're finished when when basically there's hardly any mr surfacer left and all you've got is a little groove so um i've had another look at that uh, photo etch set from rc subs and if you want to go for it by all means yeah go for it um it will sort of authenticate all this area here because I think it's got the deck, the steel plates to replace these. So it'll make it look a lot more authentic. The only trouble is, with stuff like this, and it's the same with the Revell kit, you can get these lovely photo etched wooden decks and everything that have got all the slots in them so you can see through. But the trouble is if you haven't got the, the pressure chamber inside, you know, the actual submarine tube inside, you're just going to be looking into the sub. So in reality, if you've got any large holes, when you look down through those holes, you would see the actual, where well, you would see something like, where was it? It was in here. You would see something like this, which is the top of the actual pressure vessel of the sub. Um, and then there'll probably be loads of pipe work on there. You know, some big stuff as well. So, you know, that is the only problem. You can make it all look great, 
But the problem is if you leave your flooding vents open and you don't put a, a, a roof in there for your, for your tube, then you're just going to see daylight and everything in there and it's going to look... Just, you're just looking into an open cavernous space, you know. It'd be like having a modern, modern car and putting great big bonnet vents in it, or hood vents, and not putting an engine in there, you know. Oh, like Tamiya did with the 1350, the 124 GT 350 group, uh, GT4 race car Mustang. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to actually put an engine in mine, and I might even make a resin engine bay for it, because I've got three of them now, and I'll potentially be having four very soon. But I can't work on them because of all the sanding work I'm doing, all the dust that's in the room, and you can't be spraying car bodies with a load of dust. So I'm going to stop waffling, I'm going to get on and get this sanded, get them sanded, and then I'll come back when I've done. Glug, 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 hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's night time. Right, so, uh, that's all um, done now, that's all sanded, that needs a wash. I'm going to give that a wash in the sink and a scrub of the nail brush, just to get all the, the dust and everything out of the, um, out of the, uh, the sunken detail in there. It's all beautiful, it's all lovely, it's all looking nice. Right, so, um, I'm tempted to drill these holes in here. I think these front areas have got some separate pieces that go in here. If we look on the bow, we can see we've got cutouts there and there's separate pieces that go in there. And I've got a feeling they would be thin. So we might see some thin edges on there, I don't know. So we've got our sides of our conning tower here. I've done these, the, the um, ejector pin marks, done the ejector pin marks in there, they're done. They're all going to get primed black now. I've done the inside of the um, of the uh, WWW hatch, word I couldn't think of, and I'm going to spray that black and then probably give it another sand down again. Um, it, it, the one I've seen that's all rusty didn't look particularly smooth. Now when I say that obviously it wouldn't be smooth if it was all rusty, but it looked like it was all sort of ridgy as well, so we shall see. Then I've got the top of the conning tower here, and what I'm going to do, just to finish this video off, I'm going to give this a cast texture, because texture, texture, because it looks like it was probably a casting. Um, it goes along the top of here, and there are double rows of rivets there, so I'm thinking it's probably riveted on, it's cast with a flange, so um, yeah, we shall see. So I'm going to give it a cast texture, so if you haven't seen this before, give this a go, it's not difficult. And you can start in an area where you can't see. Now, as I said, that wooden deck's going to go on here. So you can start in this area here, and no one's going to see it. And what you do is just basically flood it with thin cement. I'm using the uh, Mr. Hobby. You can use extra thin. Okay, and you're just going to basically get it wet, and then use the brush to give it a cast rough finish. Now remember this is 72nd scale. This isn't a 35th scale tank so you don't want a really rough cast texture. You want it to be like a sort of 400 grit sandpaper to keep it in scale. Now if it was a 16th scale tank you were doing you would have a a fairly sort of coarse-ish finish. Okay and there's another message come through probably from you guys. Oh, one other thing, guys, if you're messaging, if you're posting comments on my videos and they're disappearing, can you please let me know? Um, if you post a comment and it never appears, you may have put a link or something which YouTube don't like and they will often just block them. So I don't even get to see them. Um, I get the little sex ones, you know, the ones like, you know, um, come and look at my bloody porn site or whatever um, somehow they actually get through but then get pulled down very shortly afterwards and or I just delete them anyway um, but yeah if you if you happen to see if you're getting a comment if you're making a comment and all of a sudden it disappears I've got one of my one of my guys has, has emailed me today saying you know why are you taking my comments down and I'm not and he's commented on two different videos two different subjects one was this, one was Titanic. And what he said was after about 10 minutes, the message disappeared. And I didn't get a chance to comment on it. So very, very strange. Now, I know this happened a while back to Oliver. If he's watching, I think it may have happened to you again, mate, because I haven't heard from you. Um, and at the time, he thought I was doing it, but I'm not. If I, If you post absolute bullshit 
okay i will take it down and i won't even bother responding but generally if you post something that i can be construed as being rude i will generally comment something like you know are you for real or maybe i'll post something rude back and if you don't respond i just leave it there if you come back with something rude again then i block you um yeah it's very very unusual that it happens but it does seem to go in leaps and bounds the other thing youtube does which is great which is they um you suddenly start losing a load of subscribers you sort of lose you know they have 11,200 today 10,900 tomorrow 9,800 the day after you're thinking what the hell's going on here all of a sudden you know wednesday you gain 2,000 subs it's uh, it's very funny how that happens you, you, it worry it's worrying initially because you think like what have i done what have i said have i have i offended someone you know and they've reported me on twitter and now everybody that was ever subscribed is unsubscribing but anyway i'm waffling again you start calling me harry houdini soon if i keep on this hello harry i know you're watching because you love stuff like this if you are watching harry comment below be nice to hear from you right so and i know you'll be doing one of these on your channel so there you go you've watched me do that while i've been talking crap so here you are you can have a look at that and you can see that close up okay and that's now got a rough textured finish now as i say if it was 35th scale you would go for a much rougher texture if you want the rougher texture but um yeah you see a lot of people talking about models with a lovely textured finish well it's something you can do yourself um, you also see people talking about lovely textured finish on like a on a um, on a composite Sherman, and uh, you know the, the it's only the front of the hole that's cast; the rest of it is sheet. So then you get the which I've shown you on my Sherman, my sixteenth scale, how to do the uh, the hot rolled sheet steel look. That's quite an interesting finish. But there we go; that's dry already. But you can see that, and then when that's painted, that's going to look bloody awesome. When we put a wash on it. It will pick up in there and uh, yeah so that um, hatch is probably cast as well so we'll do that in fact I'll do that now just so you can see I'll do the hatch now so we'll turn the hatch over stick it on our blue tack and then we'll just go round and we'll give it a, whoops a daisy it fell off the blue tack I need to get some new blue tack. My blue tack is all like absolutely useless. It doesn't stick to anything. Although it doesn't help that that's sanded in there. So it's probably covered in dust. So let's see how we get on. There we go. You can give that a bit of an alternate finish. That's a bit of a drier finish there, so it's more sort of stipply. Now I don't know if those legs would have been welded on or cast with it. Probably cast with it, so we'll just do them as well. There we are. Okay, we're not going to see much of that because it's going to be up anyway. But um, we'll go around the edge. I think we will go around the edge because we're going to see the top edge, aren't we? So we'll just wet it. And then just put the brush on it and all you're trying to do is just and if you really want to go for it you can touch it with your fingers and make a nice rough riff rough finish on there riff rough roof what are we talking about like a bloody dog roof 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 <laughs> i've lost it i all this bloody lockdown and stayed in and not seeing anyone is doing me head in i've just lost it now there we go so there we are just the try and catch it in the light Look at my disgusting fingernails. If I do that, you don't have to look at my fingernails then. There we go. Okay, so that's easy. Nice little mod you can do. No tools required. And if, you, uh, if you're if you worried about sort of ruining your model, grab a piece of sprue. You know, grab a lump of sprue. Get, get one of your sprues out of the box. Cut a piece of sprue off it and start doing it on there. It's the same plastic. Um, I would say be a little bit careful with Airfix mod. Yeah, Airfix give you a cast texture anyway, don't they? On everything, every single part of the kit's got a cast texture, hasn't it? We all know about that, especially that Hellcat. Bloody hell. 
It's rough as old boots to finish on that. So um, there we go. <laughs> anyway, um, hope you've enjoyed that. Uh, we didn't really get much done. You listen to me waffle a lot. We got that sprayed grey, didn't we? But um, as I say, I'm sorry. I don't really want to be painting in the house now because I can't get the extractor on. And it's time for this stuff. And uh, maybe watch a film or something. And do something to eat and that. Um, yeah. Thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you tomorrow with part five. Bye for now.